Whether you're an experienced home brewer, or just a dabbler, or maybe you haven't started yet, but you're looking to try it, you may have heard some very disturbing things. Botulism! Homebrewing makes you blind. Sulfites give me a headache. These are my three favorite myths about homebrewing. And I've read lots and lots and lots of literature on these three topics. And today, we're going to bust those myths. You've heard it before. Botulism. Botulism will kill you. Don't ever drink homebrew beer. It's got botulism. Homebrew beer does not have botulism. Just like chicken noodle soup does not have botulism. Let's see what the internet has to say about botulism. More specifically, botulism in homebrew. So what is botulism? According to sui generis brewing, botulism is a form of foodborne illness caused by the bacterium Clostridium botulinum. Illness is caused by a toxin released by the bacteria. The toxin can persist in foods lacking viable bacteria, but is quickly destroyed above temperatures above 185 degrees Fahrenheit. Botulism itself is hard to kill. The bacteria forms spores when stressed, with those spores capable of surviving boiling. This is why many canned foods must be pressure canned, as destruction of botulism spores requires temperatures above 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so there's a lot of information about botulism on this website here. Let's highlight a few uh, important parts. Botulism grows under a limited range of conditions. It needs a source of protein for growth, a pH above 5.0, a salt concentration below 5 to 10 percent, a sugar concentration below 30 percent, and an oxygen concentration below 1 percent. Botulism is relatively tolerant to alcohol and is not fully suppressed until alcohol content reaches 6 percent ABV. So there you go. Anything that has an alcohol content greater than 6% is immune to botulism. The botulism toxin itself is utterly terrifying. It is the most toxic substance known to humankind. Literally millions of times more toxic than cyanide. So will botulism grow in wart or must? The good news for mead makers is that botulism is unlikely to be able to grow in must as there is not enough protein present. Ciders and wines are even more protected, as they have both a low protein content and a starting pH below 4.0. Beer is a little bit different though, because beer wort has a high protein content and a pH permissive to the growth of botulism. But there's good news. The oxygen levels achieved by normal oxygenation processes are inhibitory to growth, while the acidification during fermentation will suppress botulism long before it produces toxin. In other words, if you quickly chill your beer, oxygenate well, and immediately pitch a good dose of yeast, your risk is essentially zero. Now, I have a friend, my mead-making mentor, Dr. Bradenard. He has a PhD in microbiology and I bet he could tell me a really cool story about botulism, and if botulism could be a danger if you drink homebrew. This is a bit of a spur of the moment thing. I'm just finishing up tomorrow's video. Uh, it's a kind of like a, a, a myth, a, a mead myth buttress kind of thing. I'm talking about, okay. I'm talking about botulism in homebrew. And I suddenly thought, man, I bet Bray could tell me an awful lot about that. Oh yeah, well, Clostridium botulism, which is the, the bacteria that causes uh, botulism, is what they call an obligate anaerobe. That means it absolutely hates oxygen. And the normal levels of oxygen that we experience in our atmosphere make it difficult, if not impossible, for it to grow. So that's why you really only see it in canned goods that have been sealed away from oxygen for a long, long time. So. 
Growing any kind of Clostridium botulism in mead is practically impossible unless you canned it forever. <laughs> so that's pretty much it. So botulism and mead, not happening, right? Not gonna happen. Not gonna happen. Uh, I mean, even even with the CO2 that you're making, if you if you have enough of a yeast colony to make the CO2 required to push out the oxygen, then you have such a yeast colony that they're gonna outcompete any other bacteria anyway. And to be quite frank, if there's any bacteria that could possibly compete with yeast in any way, it would be lactobacillus from our skin. So I, there's like zero chance of botulism being an issue in me. Yeah, this is, uh, I see it all over TikTok. People are constantly posting on like home brewers, TikToks and stuff. This is how you get botulism. It's, it, it seems such an ingrained myth in our society, you know, that home brewing causes. It, it really is. Yeah, I've seen it for 10 years. I mean, people constantly worried about this sort of thing. And then, you know, the biggest thing that you see is uh, people will get an infection and it'll make a pedicle on top. So it'll look like this white webby stuff growing on top of the mead. And 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 everybody immediately jumps, you know, it, it's like WebMD. It's like, you know, I have a headache and it immediately jumps to you're dying of cancer. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I, it's really not an issue. Um, and even if you get a pedicle, a lot of times if you rack from underneath the pedicle, uh, as long as it's not a terrible pedicle, it'll just be a sour meat and actually can be quite tasty. <laughs> I wouldn't mind trying that one day. Yeah, you can do it on purpose. It's not hard. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'm quite that good just yet. <laughs> no, my luck, it'll affect the whole batch and ruin it for me. But yeah, that botulism is not an issue. You know, like I said, it's only ever really an issue in canning because you're purposely, when you boil something, you actually boil the oxygen out of it. And part of the canning process is to superheat it, and then you're superheating it under pressure and creating a vacuum. So then you have a truly non-oxygen environment. And then if it just gets like a, a ping, like just a little small crack, it has to be like a micro crack, just to get a teensy bit of something in there, that's when you possibly have some botulism problem. But you know, even that, I mean, like anybody who's opened a can of food that was bad, like immediately swells out of the can and it smells so bad you can't drink it like you just use your nose you you have you have a mass spectrometer right here it's built on the front of your face smell it if it, it smells bad don't drink it if it smells good drink it <laughs> that uh so, that, that that's weird to me a bacteria that's anaerobic like that and it doesn't want oxygen i kind of yeah yeah is it, yeah, I, I kind of assume oxygen was necessary for all life, you know? No, some really don't care for it. It just has to do with, you know, more than I want to get into if, if you're doing your video. So, <laughs> but, but you can certainly look it up on Wikipedia if you're really interested. Just look up obligate anaerobes. And, and that's bacteria that don't like oxygen? That's correct. Now, I know that Facebook's fact checkers are gonna blast me into oblivion if they ever find out about this video. Oh my gosh, Eric only read one article. He can't know anything about anything. Well, no. That one article was just the one that I used to illustrate my point. I have been researching this for a long, long time. I've read many articles. I have many leather-bound books in my library. The Wheel of Time. It's really good. Read it. Homebrew does not cause botulism. You'll get botulism from a bottle of homebrew beer, just like you'll get botulism from a can of chicken noodle soup. Homebrewing doesn't cause botulism. The bacteria causes botulism. So will alcohol make you blind? Will drinking too much alcohol or too much bad alcohol make you go blind. No, it won't. Now, alcohol comes in many kinds and many flavors, and the two that are relevant to this discussion are ethanol and methanol. Ethyl alcohol or ethanol is good alcohol. That's the alcohol that we create with fruits and grains and 
honey. Methanol is bad alcohol. It's typically made with wood. And uh, I think it's just wood. I'm not sure what else, but mainly wood. And I think that's the kind of alcohol they use to make fuel out of, like biofuel or whatever, you know? Now, ethyl alcohol is 100% no blindness safe. Well, I mean, like, there's an argument for alcoholism and excessive drunkenness and all that stuff. And methyl alcohol or methanol is very, very toxic. And it will cause blindness. But if you consume too much methanol, blindness may be the least of your concerns. Now, in typical alcohol production, you typically produce lots of ethyl alcohol and tiny, minuscule amounts of methyl alcohol. Uh, just don't argue with these numbers or hate me in the comments. Just, just go with this. Let's say you make 20 gallons of mead or wine or whatever. You have 20 gallons of the, the, the mead one gallon of that will be ethanol and one ounce of that one ounce of the 20 gallons will be methanol so if you drink that entire 20 gallons in one sitting you'll drink that one ounce of methanol about a shot of methanol which is enough to do some pretty serious effects to you but distillation removes that other 19 gallons of not alcohol so you're left over with just the gallon of pure alcohol and the shot of methanol. But that methanol is very, very, very easy to remove from that gallon of ethanol. And any moonshiner, any distiller worth his salt will discard that one ounce of methyl alcohol. I promise you it's so easy to remove. Not that I would know, I don't distill, I'm just saying. So it doesn't matter how horrible or how old or how wrong this homebrewed or not homebrewed, whatever it is, you will not go blind from drinking it. Ethyl alcohol does not cause blindness. It doesn't matter how you drink that alcohol, it doesn't matter what's done to it, it will not cause blindness. Methanol causes blindness. And if you drink enough methanol, blindness may be the worst of your worries. Or blindness may be the least of your worries. So here's the fun bit. Methanol gives you a really, really, really good drunk. Fast. In the beginning, but after a few hours, once your body is able to metabolize all that medical problem, then all the negative effects start coming into play and you will no longer have a good time. Unscrupulous moonshiners know that methanol gives you a good drunk really quickly and so they deliberately add methanol to their moonshine to increase its potency. They don't care that they'll go blind after drinking it or maybe even die. They can sell it for more and so that's what they do. This isn't really a thing anymore. This is left over from prohibition. In the prohibition days, this wasn't common, but it was a thing, but not so much anymore. Fun fact, the cure for methanol poisoning is ethanol. If you go to the emergency room because you accidentally drank some rubbing alcohol, they're going to pump wine into you to help counteract the effects of that methanol. Good alcohol is the cure for bad alcohol. So if you have a jug of moonshine that has ethanol in it and you drink it, you'll probably be just fine. You might get sick as a dog. You might have a hell of a hangover. But that itty bitty tiny bit of methanol in the bottom combined with a huge amount of ethanol, you'll be fine. You'll survive. So does home brewing anything cause blindness? No, it doesn't. This myth is false. It's a leftover superstition from prohibition days that barely even applied back in prohibition days and most certainly doesn't apply anymore. Homebrewed anything will not make you go blind any more or less than commercially made anything. Now the other two myths, botulism and blindness, they are false, but they do have a smidgen of a kernel of truth to them. Homebrewing does not cause botulism, but you can get botulism by drinking a bottle of beer. It's possible. You can get botulism by drinking homebrew beer, just like you can get botulism by eating a can of tuna. If the botulism bacteria is there and it's left for long enough to create the toxin, then you'll get botulism. And you can go blindness by drinking moonshine. Homemade alcohol, just like commercial alcohol, does not cause blindness. 
but it has happened before and it is possible. If there is a large amount of methanol in that bottle of whatever it is you're drinking. But this third myth is straight up false. There is no merit to it whatsoever. Not even a smidgen of a kernel of truth. And this myth is that sulfites are bad for you. Oh, I got a headache. Sulfites give me a headache. No, they don't. And I'm sorry that you have a headache, but your headache was not caused by sulfites. Did you know that sulfites are a naturally occurring chemical? They're not a man-made thing. They occur naturally in nature. They are a byproduct of fermentation and they're found naturally in many fruits and vegetables. They are not only present in all wines, they're also one of the most common preservatives used in many foods, like trail mix, soup mixes, and gravy mixes. Now you may come across somebody who says that sulfites give them headaches. I'm sad to say, but they are mistaken. No link has ever been found to sulfites and headaches. If the person gets a headache from drinking red wine for the sulfites, they would also get a headache when they eat apricots, or trail mix, or chicken noodle soup, or powdered gravies. Sulfites are everywhere in everything. They are put in many of our foods and they are found naturally in many, many, many fruits and vegetables. Now there are dangers in sulfites. Sulfites can trigger severe asthmatic reactions in sensitive people. We call this an allergy. Some people are very, very allergic to sulfites, just like some people are very, very, very allergic to peanuts. People who drink sulfites who are sensitive to sulfites will experience effects of allergies, hives, scratchy throat, coughing, sneezing, just like hay fever. This is why the USDA requires sulfites to be on the label of a product if they're used in amounts above 10 parts per million for allergen reasons. The same reasons that this product contains peanuts must be on the label if it has peanuts because some people are severely allergic to sulfites and people who suffer from these allergies can experience severe reactions, sometimes even death. So if you have reactions to red wine and you think it's sulfites, you might want to think again. It's not the sulfites that you're reacting to, it's the alcohol. If you were reacting to the sulfites, you would experience the same reaction when you eat apricots or trail mix. Sulfites are on the top 10 list of most common allergens in the United States. So sulfites do not cause headaches and sulfites are not bad for you. They cause allergic reactions in people who are allergic to them. Your headaches are not caused by sulfites.